Okay, we have looked at so far this semester what are known as static web pages. Static, when used this way, means unchanging. So, in other words, if you were to bring up lab one and, and view it in the browser, it would look today just exactly like it looked when you turned it in. There'd be no change. It doesn't matter who looks at it. If I look at it, if you look at it, um, we'll pull up the same HTML, we're going to get the same results. And it's going to look identical to the way you turned it in. That's static and that's unchanging. Many websites, though, are not like that. Many websites have content that changes on a regular basis. Uh, for example, <coughs> if we both log into uh, to Canvas, if we both log into Canvas, we'll get a home page, and I will get a home page, and it's the same page, but it looks a lot different. So here's what you get. Here's what I get when I log into Canvas. I get this. Right? These are the classes and groups that I belong to, along with the things that I have to grade. Yours isn't going to look like that. Yours is going to be based on your credentials. In other words, your login. Yours is going to show the classes that you're enrolled in. What's more, because I'm defined as the instructor in these classes, I'm able to do certain things that you're not. For example, I'm able to, if I view this, this classes page, I'm able to grade assignments and you're not able to. So, even though we're accessing the same page, we're not really accessing the same page. The contents are different depending on who logs in. I'll give you another example. If we go to Facebook, you log in. I log in, we're both going to the same Facebook page. However, I see my friends in their latest posts. You see your friends in their latest posts. So same page, yet it's different depending on who logs in. Google's an example of a dynamic page. If I type something in that I'm searching for. Oh, no. Sorry, what's that? Hello? Did someone say something? If I search for Italian restaurants near me, I get a list of restaurants that are very near to my location. All right, Sorrento's is in Sheffield. Angelina's Pizza is somewhere on Abbey Road. Marco's Pizza is somewhere on Detroit Road, and so on. I see TripAdvisor is so the 10 best Italian restaurants in Illyria. I see Yelp, the 10 best Italian restaurants in Illyria. All of my results here are related to, first of all, the fact that I searched for Italian restaurants and not hamburger joints, all right? Secondly, the fact that I'm in Illyria and not somewhere else. So. Two people could look, you could look for different things, or you could be a different person, even in a different part of the country that search Google, and you're going to get different results. So the search results page changes depending on who's logged in. That's what I mean by a dynamic website. So if we're going to draw a diagram of that, we talked about this a little bit last time. We have a client. That's the person that is surfing the web. It's connected to the internet. And they make requests to a web server, whether it be Lorraine Community College's Canvas site or Google or your website that you, you build uh, and get a, a, a 
the domain name and so on. So you have a server. And in the case of static pages, the server's jobs are is simple. So if you were to create, if you were to take your project from this course and put it on a web server, the web server would have a very easy job. All it would do is when someone requests a page, it would go out and find it, store it somewhere on the server's disk, and deliver it. So the user requests it. server responds to the request and delivers a document that contains HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and other stuff. All right. Now, that's for static pages, pages that don't change. The other kind of pages, dynamic pages, The server has a different job. The server retrieves the recipe to create the page. In programming terms, it's known as a script. Script is a little program. And the server processes that page. That is, it executes the instructions to create a search result page for Italian restaurants in Illyria or whatever. That will often involve interacting with the database somewhere. All right. And the user or the server takes that script, processes it, and produces a web page specifically for that request. So I log into Canvas, I get my Canvas page. Use the login, you get your Canvas page. The same scripts are being accessed in both cases. The difference is that I've given my credentials and it pulls up all the courses for me. And then when you access it, it pulls up all the courses for you. Okay. We are not going to cover dynamic web pages in this class. We cover dynamic pages in other classes, for example, CISS uh, 232, CISS 243 also. Probably some in CISS 268. However, we are going to cover one ingredient of this process. We're going to cover the ingredient of allowing a user to enter data that the script is going to use to process the request and do its job. So, for example, in the two, re in the two examples that I've given, searching Google and logging into Canvas, how does Google or Canvas know what information to pull up? It pulls it up based on what you have typed into a text box. So I type in my user ID and password into Canvas. I send that request to the Canvas web server. Canvas looks, searches the database and makes sure that I've given the right information for user ID and password. Then it looks, if I've given the right information, it looks and uh, 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 assembles all the web page, all the courses that I am teaching and creates an HTML page form and delivers them back to the client. In Google, when I do a search, I type in what I want to search for. The web server goes and searches data, uh, Google's database to find the relevant responses. Now, in the case of Google, there's other ingredients, right? We've already said that location is something that is considered when you do a search in Google. All right, and you don't type that in. So there's other things besides information entered on a form that are relevant to server-side scripting pages, but we're just going to consider data entered in the form. And what we're going to do is we're going to sort of recreate a Google search. All right, I can do that because Google allows us to do that. And I can sort of reverse engineer the way Google's requests uh, are formatted 
so that I can create a, a web page that formats a request to Google server and make it the same way. So for example, if I search for something, I search for Italian restaurants near me, you'll notice the page that gets called. It's called, let's, let's copy this. Let's bring this into words so we can take a closer look at, uh, at it. We're going to look at a couple pieces of it specifically. There's a lot of stuff that gets sent to Google. We're only interested in some of it. We're only interested in this part of it. The rest are things that Google uses, but they're not absolutely necessary to make a request to Google server. So I'm going to lop off all of that. And I'm just going to look at the, the absolute minimum that we need to make a request to Google server. We're going to call the page google.com slash search. That's the page that gets called no matter what we search for. So if I change from Italian restaurants to Asian restaurants, guess what? I call the same script. See, the page name is the same in both cases. Now, this question mark is the same in both cases. The Q is the same in both cases. And the equal sign is, is uh, the same in both cases. What is different? What is different is this right here. After the question in a request is what is called the query string. Think query question. And the, the data that gets put on the query string is more information that the server is going to need in order to do its job. So I can't just say, well, I want to do a Google search. I have to say a Google search for what? Where do we put that? We put that on the query string. And we call that information Q. A query string consists of a bunch of pieces of data. And each piece of data is separated from the others with an ampersand. And there'll be the name of a piece of data. And there'll be the value for that piece of data. And that repeats over for as many pieces of data as you send. In our case, again, we only need the one piece of data, what we're searching for to make a Google request work. So the query string consists of a pair, pairs of data, the name and the value. We then have an ampersand and then we have the next name and next value and so on down the line. So the question is, is how do we get that data to be part of the URL? So this is a web page that gets called when we do a Google search for Italian restaurants. How can we reconstruct that? Well, that's what I'm going to show you now. So let's go into the 
this page right here, search. I'm going to make it bigger so that we can see. I'm going to type in HTML and click submit, and we get results relating from Google of HTML. Now, notice what the query, what the URL is that gets called. Same thing as before. First part is the same. Second part is Q equals the thing that we're searching for. So that's what we're going to see how to create that string so that we can do a Google search. I could also search for Italian restaurants. Near me. Capitalize, I guess. And there we go. We get the same results that we did when we used Google's form. Do the search. Okay, so let's look at the HTML that creates this. So I'm going to bring up. page, which is search.html, and it's actually a very small page. I have the standard tags, the dot type equals, HTML lang equals English, the header with the title, the body, and the end HTML tag. I then have a form tag. All right. A form tag, think of a form tag as being like an envelope. It's an envelope that we're going to put data to send to the server. So we have two pieces of data here. Actually, one of them we're not going to send to the server, but the other one we are. Input type equals text. That means we want a text box. What is a text box? A text box is a line that you can enter a single line of data in. So you could use text box for a phone number. But if you were doing a piece of delivery or something like that, and you had special instructions, you might want to allow for multiple lines to be entered. In which case you would not have a text box, you'd use something else. So input type equals text means we have on the page a text box. Now, the name. The name is what this is going to be called on the query string. So we're going to call, when we submit this, by pressing this button, we're going to send that piece of data, whatever's in the text box, in a variable called Q on the query string. Where are we going to send it to? We're going to send it to whatever the action of the form is. And the action of the form is HTTP www.google.com slash search. So we're sending it to this script, which we have here. And what are we calling that piece of data on the query string? We're calling it Q. The submit button doesn't have a name. That means we're not sending not sending the, the data from the submit button to Google server. We could if we wanted to. But 
So I could do that. Then when I entered something in, notice what the query string has now. It has submit button equals submit. That way the script knows what submit button gets pressed. Now keep in mind, we're using Google's script to receive our request because we're not studying server-side scripting in this class. When you study server-side scripting, you'll write both ends of it. You'll write the HTML that uh, allows you to accumulate form data, and you'll write the server code that processes it. Now, sometimes you might have a form that has two buttons. Like maybe you bring up a piece of information and you can either update it or delete it depending on which button you press. In a case like that, it's necessary to know what button is pressed. So we can send what button was pressed along with the data on the query string. Here it doesn't matter, Google doesn't use that field for anything. It only uses a field called Q. So let's look at these pieces and Let's break it down. What is this? This is the action. Oh, and I can, I can, can I draw on this? I can. This is the action of the form. should say action. We look at the HTML, that's the action of the form. The question mark is because we've said that the method is get. There's two ways that you can send data to the server. One is called get and one is called post. When you send the data via get, it's put on the query string. When you send it via post, it's sent another way and it's not visible on the query string. We're not going to worry about that one for now. We're going to only use get as the method. So the question mark comes from the fact that we said that the method is get. So it adds that to the query string or adds that to the end of the URL. The Q is the name of the form field. This is the value of the form field. This is a separator. And then this is the next thing on the form and its value. Now, again, in order for this to work, I had to know what Google was expecting. And I did that simply by doing a Google query and looking at the URL that was formed. In a real project, you would be writing both. So you would know what the script was named because you're the one that made the script. And you'll know what to put the values on the query string, what names to give them, because you're the one that's going to create the query, uh, the, uh, the uh, server-side script that contains those fields from the form. So that's a very, very basic form, about as simple of a form as that you could get. Form, tag, envelope that goes around everything. Action is the name of the script we're going to send it to. Get is how we're going to send the data. Get equals that we're going to send it as part of the URL on the query string. Name says this the, the value of this field is going to be put 
in a variable named Q on the query string. This says the value that this is a submit button and it was clicked is going to be put in the name submit button. And then we send it to that script and the script does its thing and displays the search results. All right, let's look at another example of this. This is a little bit more involved. And we're gonna look at a couple of things with this. First of all, notice that there are not only text box on this page. There's actually text box for us to enter a single line of text or this, this, and this. Actually, just for this and this, this is something else. Let's say this is a registration form where you're registering for a, a, a music website or an entertainment web website. Text, plain old text box, plain old text box. So I can type in the value here and I can type in the value here. All right, the next thing is not a text box because we want to control what the users put in there. If this was a text box for age range, we could put, it was a plain old text box, the user could type anything in. Could type 35 years old, those words, or it could just type a 35. Or it could, you could just type in the word old. All right. What this does is this gives us categories that we have predefined that we want the user to select. So we'll select age range. Password would be the password entered and notice that when we enter the password, data is not echoed back to the screen. That way, if someone was peeking over your shoulder, they wouldn't be able to see it on the screen. Down here, we have preferences, favorite style of music and favorite sport. We're only allowed to pick one of these because it says your favorite. So I know people can like a lot of different kinds of music, but for this, the purposes of this example, you have to pick your one favorite. So we can pick hip hop, country, rock. Favorite sport the same way. This is like a radio button because it's like the old fashioned radio buttons in your car. When you press one, it turns off the others. And notice that these two things work independently of each other. In other words, if I change the style of music, I don't affect the favorite sport or vice versa. Finally, our next we have checkboxes. And checkboxes can either be checked or unchecked so that they're going to be yes or no questions. Comments are a free form text box where we can put in multiple pieces of data. Like, I am happy to join this site, for example. Multiple lines. We can actually make it even bigger if we want. Finally, we have submit one and submit two. And I honestly don't remember what those two things do. Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. We'll see in a minute. Submit one sends it to this special place that's used for education. That all it does is it takes the data that you've entered on the form 
and outputs it. So we can see that I entered in Mike Zellers' name, M. Zellers at Lorraine is the email. I'm in category four. I wasn't very clever and I used the password of password and I picked these things. The other method, when I press it, that data gets sent. It's in a different place. It's not in the query string. It's in what is called the post data. So notice the difference. In this case, I have In this, I have to see what's wrong. In one case, I'm sending it on the query string, and the other, I'm sending it in post data. It wasn't working exactly how it was. I'll take a look at it. So. There's a couple other things going on here. Notice how these form fields are grouped together. So are these. So what's also important is the styling of a form to make it nice and neat. Because if we do this without any style, it's going to look ugly. So let's bring up that page, which is search to. Oh, what am I saying? What, what are those two buttons? What are the difference? Oh, I just did that to show you. Never, never I this the two buttons do something different than I thought at first. This button, notice it says that button one was pressed. This button says button two was pressed. Okay. So the reason we can't see the data is because we've said. The method equals post. If we say method of get, then we type something in. And submit it there. We send it on the query string and you can see all the data on the query string that we passed with ampersands in between them. Okay, let's look at these form controls one at a time. All right, first two things are plain old text boxes. So we've seen how those work before. There's something extra though. There's an ID. And associated with the ID, we have a label. So, in other words, this label name belongs to this field. Well, of course it does. It's right next to it. It's right next to it for people that can see. For people that are blind or accessing this page, it's difficult for them to tell what this field is unless we use a label tag. And this label tag simply says that this label is for the thing with this ID. So it's not uncommon to have the same ID as the name with the ID and name being used for different purposes. The name is used to send the data to the server. The ID is used to link the label to it. So there'll be label tags for each of these. Label for text email that matches it up with that. Otherwise, these are plain old text boxes like we saw before. All right, now we have a label for DD age. DD stands for drop down. DD age, which is this statement here. A drop down is accomplished by a select tag. And the select tag contains a list of options. That way I can restrict the user to only selecting one of the possible options. So, first option, 
says, please choose age range, and it has no value. The second option is 0 through 18 and has a value of 1. This is what the user is going to see in the drop down. This is the value that gets sent to the server. If you remember when I picked 61 plus, the value that got sent to the server for DD age was 4. That's because it's the value of the corresponding option. Now, you have an assignment where you create a pizza order coming up. And for that, if you're doing size and you only have three sizes, small, medium, and large, you're not going to make it so it's a text box because someone could type in anything if it was a text box. It could type in tiny or personal or really big. And that doesn't mean anything to you because you only have three sizes, small, medium, and large. A dropdown will force the user to pick only one of those options. We have a password here. Notice the type is password. That means when we type in here, it isn't echoed back. Okay, so that's the first part of the form. Second part of the form, we have label four. This is one time where the name and the ID is not going to match. We have here what is called a, a list of radio buttons. The label is going to be for each individual radio button. So RB Rock that points to this radio button. And the type is radio, and notice that the name of the radio button is the same for each element in the group. So all three of these are options for music. Therefore, they all have the same name, but each has its own ID. There's only ever one thing on a page that has an ID, has a particular ID. So the fact that these all the same all have the same name make them act like radio buttons. Whereas I click one, it unselects the other. I then have favorite sport, and I have my choices and these are linked together by a name and they have a value. Finally, I have check boxes, which are either a yes or a no. So if I check this, the value is yes. If I check CB mailing, the value is yes. Lastly, I have a text area, and a text area is what you use for multiple line comments. And I want to review the styling of this page. Then I want to talk about what you should look at for your lab assignment, what, what your homework sort of is to study this week online. Let's open up the style sheet. All right, form. I put a border around the form. All right. First of all, let's look at what this will look like without any style sheet. I'll cut the whole, all the contents of the style sheet. It's going to look like this. It's not too bad, but we can do better. I think we'd all agree that this is a little neater. 
because these don't line up. Whereas if we do this, these line up here. So each form element is in its own LI tag. So we have a list for each section of the form. And each form item is an LI. Now we say that there's no list style type, so we don't get bullets for, we don't get bullets for the uh, each list item. Each label we set the width of 40%. Form, we give a width of 50%. The minimum width is 400 pixels. So as we size this, it takes up half the page until we get to a certain point, then it gets no smaller. The label takes up 40% of it. The display is inline block. We say inline block because you need to make it inline block to, to handle things like the text align and the width property. I think both of those properties. And we align it to the right so that each label is lined up evenly around its left its right margin. The form we put a border around 50% and margin auto. That's all we've done, and yet we've made this form look a lot neater. Now, the one thing that I didn't mention that's important is I use a field set. A field set is good for accessibility, but again, like many accessibility items, it also benefits people that don't have the particular disability. A field set simply groups things together. So, for example, this I'm calling personal data, this I'm calling preferences. Just nice to sort of categorize things. So, I have one field set that goes around the first list and a second field set that goes around the second list. And for each field set, I can put a legend. That's what appears here. I could style the legend if I want to. Maybe make it a little bigger. About size 1.5 M. It's one and a half times as big as it normally is. Therefore, there we made it bigger. All right, what I showed you here is the standard form values that have been in all of HTML from long, long ago. Several years back, we've had HTML5. And there's some new form controls that you could use that makes your life easier. If we look at those, we could go to this site. And look at HTML5 input types. And it shows a list of all of them. Button, checkbox, color, date, date, time, email, file. So uh, you could, instead of saying type equals text for email, you could say type equals email. What good does that do you?
sure made any difference. Ah, there we go. When we go to submit it, it tells us, hey, that's not an email. You need the at sign in the email. So these text boxes, you can put anything in, whereas these specialized controls, you have to put in a specific kind of value. So here's input text, password, submit. Those are the ones we've all looked at. A reset button, which I would suggest you never use because that clears out the data normally. Radio button, checkbox, button. Input type color. So I can ask what your favorite color is. And you can select from this little color designer. So my favorite color is green. I can put that there. And again, it doesn't work on certain versions of the browser. The good news is, is it just will be a plain text field if it doesn't work on a particular browser. A date. We get a date picker. These are nice because it limits what the user can enter and therefore you have to write less JavaScript validation because JavaScript is typically used to validate things like text fields because you could put anything in. And that sometimes isn't good. So go through and study all of these. See where they will be useful in the assignment that you have. All right. Uh, that's all for forms. You probably won't have the case uh, to have any forms on your web page. You could put them there if you wanted them but they wouldn't be functional because we're not learning how to write the server-side script to handle the request. So you can put them on if you want, but again, it, it, uh, it won't have any effect unless there's server-side script. That's all I had. We'll see you either next week or see you in lab.